afternoon. It's Wednesday, March 22nd. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News broadcasting live from Jerusalem. We open with the ongoing police investigation into the corruption scandal that involves Israel Aerospace Industries. Police from the Lahav 433 National Fraud Unit arrested two additional suspects this morning. One of the suspects is the son of a serving government minister. Ten other suspects were also detained for questioning in connection to the affair, which surrounds allegations of corruption, money laundering, and fraud involving workers at IA IAI. Police are also seeking to determine if workers granted favors to those who agreed to join the Likud party. Police searched the homes of the suspects, who would be brought before the magistrate's court in Rishon Letzian for a possible extension of their remand. Details of the police probe into IAI were made public last week, and so far 14 suspects, some of whom hold senior positions at IAI and others who belong to private companies that provide IAI with services, have been arrested in the probe that followed a month-long covert police investigation. Police this morning sealed the East Jerusalem home of terrorist Fadi al Qader, who rammed his truck into a group of army cadets visiting the Armona Nazif promenade on January 8th, killing four soldiers and injuring 15. A large presence of police and border police were deployed in Jabal Mukhabar to secure the area and prevent clashes, while security forces sealed the terrorist's house. Last month, the High Court of Justice rejected an appeal to prevent the demolishing of the home. In other defense-related news, an IDF tank fired a shell at three Palestinians spotted by soldiers approaching the southern Gaza border fence overnight, killing one and injuring two others. The Army says soldiers manning a surveillance post became suspicious after the three were seen digging in the ground close to the border fence and feared they were planting a bomb. Soldiers alerted troops deployed nearby and a tank shell was fired and hit the Palestinians. Media reports in Gaza said the dead Palestinian was 18 years old. IDF Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot stressed today that while the threat of tunnels emanating from Gaza is severe, it is not as existential or strategic one. Speaking during a discussion at the Knesset State Control Committee, Eisenkot said that up until now, the Army has invested 2.2 billion shekels in dealing with the tunnel threat. Eisenkot added that since Operation Protective Edge, the IDF has significantly intensified its response to Palestinian rocket fire from Gaza and adopted a zero-tolerance policy to any disturbance of quiet. He stressed the army is striking operational Hamas targets in Gaza, actively thwarting the tunnels and not just sand dunes or empty storage houses. Rebel groups operated in Syria claim Israeli fighter jets struck targets near the Syrian capital of Damascus overnight. IBA's Margot Dudkevich has the latest. In the fourth such incident attributed to Israel in less than a week, rebel groups said Israeli fighter jets targeted Syrian military positions in the Mount Kassion region. While Israel has yet to confirm or deny the reports, it has constantly emphasized it is determined to prevent the transfer of chemical weapons or other game-changing weaponry to Hezbollah. Yesterday, while visiting in Beijing, China, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel will continue to conduct such missions in Syria to contain threats against Israel. He dismissed reports that Russia had demanded Israel halt all such activities. Speaking at the Mayor de Gun conference at the Netanyahu Academic College yesterday, Defense Minister Viktor Lieberman echoed remarks made earlier this week emphasizing that while Israel has no interest in interfering in what is happening inside Syria, it will respond, if fired on, to stop the arms flow to terror organizations or in cases of a ticking bomb, meaning a terror attack is imminent. Yesterday, the army confirmed one of its Skylark drones had crashed inside Syria and said it was investigating the circumstances but said there was no risk of a breach of classified information. The army's response came after media sources affiliated with the Syrian regime and Hezbollah claimed they had downed a drone in the Kanecha area and released visuals of the damaged drone. Mogo Dutkevich, IBA News. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today wrapped up his four-day visit to China and is set to arrive back in the country overnight. Upon his arrival, Netanyahu will be forced to deal with the brewing coalition crisis 
over the fate of future public broadcasting, which still remains up in the air. Sources close to the Prime Minister says his first order of business will be to sit down with Finance Minister Moshe Kahlon in a bid to resolve their disagreements over the issue. In any case, one of the hurdles the two face is the fact that any compromise reached would have to be approved by the Knesset, which today ended its winter session going on break until May. This while the new Broadcasting Corporation is set to begin operations on April 30th, leading to the closure of our own Israel Broadcasting Authority. In the shadow of the ongoing coalition crisis and wrapping up its winter session, the Knesset plenum today voted on a series of law proposals. Among the bills officially approved were expanding restrictions on convicted sex offenders who return to harass their victims and the Stay Dove bill, which was unanimously approved with 73 MKs voting in its favor. The bill postpones the permanent closure of the Stay Dove airport, keeping open the civilian portion of the terminal at least until the end of 2018, when the military side is scheduled for closure. Many MKs express concern over whether or not the Knesset will reconvene in six weeks' time as scheduled or be forced to go on an imposed election recess because the country will go to the ballots due to the coalition crisis. Before returning to Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu proudly announced the signing of a series of cooperation agreements with China. During his visit to the Far East nation, Netanyahu, accompanied by a prestigious Israeli delegation, co-chaired the third meeting of the Joint China-Israel Committee on Innovation Cooperations. Health, science, economic and environment ministers from both sides set deals on a wide range of areas, including medicine, technology and agriculture. One of the agreements signed is a $10 million joint project for cutting-edge brain research. Netanyahu stressed his aim is to combine forces with China to get the best of both worlds and move towards a bilateral free trade agreement in the near future. We partnered with you. We will show unbelievable capacities for change and growth and management and industry and global market reach. I think the combination is very, very powerful. I think there is a natural marriage in the questions of clean air, uh, clean water and available water, food, transportation, communications, and the last area which I think is absolutely critical, which is health. Uh, with uh, new technology, we can make people live longer, personalize their medicine, prevent a lot of the diseases that are available. All of that is happening. Um, uh, in exciting ways in Israel, and we're very excited about trying to bring this technology to China for the betterment of, uh, of everybody. President Ruven Rivlin, currently on a state visit to Vietnam, opened one of the country's largest bilateral economic conferences yesterday and also toured an exhibit of Israeli defense equipment together with the Vietnamese defense minister. The two met with the heads of Israel's defense companies, including the Israeli military industries, Albert Systems, Rafael, and Israel Aerospace Industries. Speaking in a joint press conference, along with the Vietnamese defense minister, Rivlin emphasized the importance of the army and defense industry, not only in times of war, but also in safeguarding peace. My friend, this is the time for Vietnam. The Vietnamese market economy is growing rapidly at a steady pace. And I'm proud that trade between Israel and Vietnam has increased significantly over the past few years. After a nine-year hiatus, Israel and Venezuela are reportedly conducting talks aimed at restoring diplomatic ties between the two countries. According to an exclusive report aired on Channel One last night, officials from both sides have met a number of times to examine ways of restoring relations. Under the rule of the late President Hugo Chavez, ties between Jerusalem and Caracas soured. Following the 2008-2009 Gaza War, Chavez broke off diplomatic ties with Israel, accusing it of war crimes against the Palestinians, and expelled Israel's ambassador and the embassy's diplomatic staff from the country. Israel then responded by expelling diplomatic staff from Venezuela. In other news, Kuwait is leading efforts to have Israel expelled from their interparliamentary union, citing Israel's so-called violation of international resolutions, which include settlement activities as the reason. Chairman of the Persian Gulf Country's National Assembly announced the plans to lead such efforts yesterday at the end of a gathering of IPU members in Morocco. 
He said his country was tasked with preparing a list of clauses that will determine whether to impose sanctions on parliaments who are viewed as breaching IPU principles. In 2002, Israel was admitted as a member of the IPU 12 plus group that includes European countries, the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Israel is facing an existential crisis by not pursuing a two state solution, former Mossad head Tamir Pardo warned yesterday. Addressing a conference in memory of late Mossad chief Mayor Dagan in Netanya, Pardo asserted that without separating from the Palestinians, demographic trends would soon put an end to Israel as a Jewish state. Jabbing at the country's leadership and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's backing away from the two-state solution, Pardo said Israel has decided not to choose, hoping the conflict will one day resolve itself or that the Arabs will one day disappear in some kind of cosmic miracle. The time has come, he said, to solve Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel's multi-tier air defense system will become fully operational next month with the deployment of the anti-missile battery David Sling, also known as the Magic Wand. David Sling is designed to shoot down medium and long-range rockets fired from a distance of up to 300 kilometers. It is the final addition to the country's air defense shield that includes the Iron Dome system, which can intercept short-range rockets, and the long-range Aero-2 and Aero-3 missile system, which jointly built by the U.S. and Israel, can intercept and destroy ballistic missiles. The Haifa District Court yesterday sentenced Israeli Arab woman Sabrine Zabadat to 50 months in prison for her involvement in the Islamic State terror group in Iraq. The 30-year-old woman from the northern Arab town of Sakhnin was also slapped with a $2,200 fine. Zabidat and her husband Wissam were arrested by the Shin Bet Security Agency on their return from Iraq with their three children. The husband is being tried separately after he admitted to joining the terror group. In 2015, the couple traveled to Europe to attend a family event, and from there, without informing their relatives, they continued to Turkey. They contacted another Israeli Arab who had joined ISIS and assisted them to enter Syria, where they lived in Raqqa, and later moved to Iraq. The husband fought in ISIS ranks, and Zabidat worked in an ISIS hospital. The couple's children are being cared for by relatives. Police are seeking to press charges against Netanya Mayor Miriam Feierberg on grounds of corruption. According to findings of a month's long investigation, police have come to the conclusion that Feierberg and her family allegedly received benefits from numerous real estate developers in exchange for promoting their business. The bribes reportedly totals hundreds of thousands of shekels. Police also recommended issuing indictments against the mayor's, Netanya mayor's ex-husband, Eli Feierberg, and her son, Safrir. The court now has to rule whether to accept the police recommendation and file an indictment. In regional news that the order of Egypt's attorney general, convicted former Egyptian president Husni Mubarak, was set free yesterday after spending nearly four years in an Egyptian military hospital. Earlier this month, the 88-year-old Mubarak was acquitted on charges of killing protesters during the 2011 Arab Spring Uprising. In May 2015, he was sentenced to three years on charges of corruption and embezzlement, serving his jail term in hospital due to his deteriorating health condition. Mubarak's sons were also charged. However, on Monday, the Attorney General accepted the former president's request to include time spent in prison pending trial as part of the sentence in the corruption case. And back here at home, foreign dignitaries, religious leaders, and donors were among those who today attended a festive ceremony and the unveiling of the shrine where Jesus was born at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem's Old City. Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras was among the attendees who stood in front of the edicule as hymn hymns were sung at the ceremony, which marked the culmination of a nine-month renovation and restoration project. This after the tomb and sacred Utica, Edekel had become discolored due to centuries of candle smoke and pilgrims' visits. The almost $4 million no. renovation project was carried out by the church's denominations, whose disputes held up restoration for more than 200 years. The Greek Orthodox, Armenian, and Roman Catholic denominations share custody of the holy site, which is visited by millions of Christians every year. Prague's Jewish community celebrated the arrival of two new Torah scrolls at the city's 700-year-old Old New Synagogue this week, the first delivered to the country since World War II and the massacre of the city's Jews during the Holocaust. The Torahs, funded by the Prague Jewish community and written in Israel, were welcomed with a festive ceremony during which guests scripted their final letters. Rumor has it that the remains of the legendary Golem of Prague 
a mystical monster, a mythical monster who is said to have defended the community against oppression, lies in the synagogue's attic. In local money matters, shares were mostly down in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, while the shekel weakened in foreign currency trading. Here are the numbers. And the IBA weather team says there will be no change in temperatures tomorrow. Skies will remain cloudy, and there is a chance of isolated showers and possible thunderstorms. Here are the highs and lows at home and abroad. And that's all for this newscast. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same channel, when Yael Shear will be at this desk. Until then, I'm Laura Cornfield wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.